Brighton Beach Busking presents Harris, Sadie, Goran, Chris, Mike the Mike. Welcome to the Busking Break. I know, I'm so excited to be here. Oh, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. The show where we interview your favourite Brighton Beach buskers, finding out the stories behind the musicians that sound our streets. I've done with all these people together, have I killed everybody? <laughs> like stressing out, like, oh my god, what am I going to do with my life? Bro, bro, bro. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notifications bell so you do not miss an episode. So come with us and be part of this journey. Hello and welcome to the busking break here at the Works Pier. Today I spoke with Goran. It was an incredible conversation, really inspiring, and I hope you enjoy it. Goran. Hello. Welcome to the busking break. Very How nice to be here. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Good stuff. So, guitar player, singer, songwriter, harmonica, member of the Big Push. Um, tell us about your journey as a musician. When did you start? Why did you start? And how has it got you to to here today? Well, yeah, no, I, I like, I, I start, I mean, I started out playing like as a kid, there's a lot of sort of musicians I do. Um, I started playing violin when I was like seven or eight. Cool. I only did it for about a year or two, probably, I don't know, did a grade or something like that. Um, then started taking piano lessons when I was about 10 to about 14. Um, and then I started playing bass. Okay. Uh, uh, when I was about 13, but I only played punk music for about two years. Like, it's the first band I was ever really into was the Sex Pistols. Oh, like cool. The first, yeah, oh, my awesome. mum got me Never Mind the Bollocks when I was like <laughs> 12 or something like that. And um, yeah, so I was obsessed with just punk and just doing, you know, all day, every day. And I started playing bass a bit more seriously and branching out a little bit musically when I was about 15. Um, and I actually, I played bass for about, uh, yeah, about five or six years, and I was, you know, but I always, I always really loved singing. I used to sing all the time when I was a little kid. It would drive people insane because I couldn't sing at all. It was awful. <laughs> they'd, they'd be like, "Just please, chart, <laughs> like actually, just stop," you know. Um, and then I went to BIM, and I was set to do the base course. I went and did the open day, and went and, you know, it was all about, you know, sort of becoming a, you know, sort of session bass player or whatever okay, it is yeah. you might have ended up doing. And um, at the last minute, uh, I went, I decided to change. I started learning guitar when I was about 19. Mm -hmm. I started playing acoustic and writing songs and singing mm -hmm. around then. And my, my, my voice was so underdeveloped, you know, I had barely any range or uh -huh. anything, like bum notes, you know, like anyone starting yeah, yeah. out singing. But I, I really loved it and it was what, where my heart really was, you know. Um, so I switched courses at the last minute and decided to do the songwriting course at BIM. Um, and that to me was almost like some kind of affirmation, like I'm a, I'm a singer now, I'm a songwriter because uh -huh. I got on this course. Yeah, yeah. Of course, they'll take bloody anyone. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But for me, it was a big deal. And then, um, yeah, and I started singing and playing guitar and then didn't have many friends at my first year of uni. And then I met some guys who were like, where I grew up was quite a small town. There wasn't a lot of musicians okay. and music and stuff. Um, so I, the only people I ever, I played with my brother a couple of times, um, I played with some, you know, a uh, few friends. I had a band at school, um, which I played bass in, but then a lot of people, a lot of my friends, certainly in my social group, they weren't very into the same music as me and stuff like that. So, um, I met these guys at uni who had a band, a blues band, and they were, I was at a party. Well, the first times I was at a party at their place and they played the Rolling Stones and David oh, Bowie cool. and all this really awesome stuff, which I love. And I was like where have you guys been all my life? So then we started going out busking. And um, then we it was really just a bit of a, bit of a piss around at night. You mm -hmm. know, we'd go out at night on a Friday, draw a crowd, have a bit of a pie, spend all the money on booze, you know, like a bit mad. And that was where I started busking really. And then um, I'm just splurging and giving you so yeah, much it's cool, it's cool. Um, but then I I took I decided in 2015 after I've been singing and writing songs for about a year or two I sort of felt like I was starting to write good songs because my first ones were dreadful when I was about 19 awful awful lyrics um didn't really understand songwriting but then I started to get to the point where I felt like I could write good songs but I didn't have much to write about so I decided to take my way my myself away on a trip uh around Europe busking and hitchhiking and I've been like idealizing a lot of like 
sort of, you know, the old blues players who uh-huh. used to like hot freight trains uh-huh. and Jack Kerouac, Woody Guthrie, that uh-huh. sort of thing. I was getting big into Bob Dylan. Um, and I decided I wanted to see how far I could go with no means or like idea of what I was doing, just kind of vagabond around the place. And I left my uh, home in my uh, town which is back west, which is near sort of Bournemouth, Southampton. Okay. And um, uh, went and st- walked out from through my front door and started hitchhiking towards Dover. Made it as far as New Haven, where a policeman gave me a lift down to the port, wow. there, which I didn't know there was a, a. He nearly arrested me for trying to hitchhike off an A road, but. Um, and went down to France and was busking and hitchhiking and went and travelled all over France, Italy and Germany for about wow. three months. And doing that trip, busking constantly, when I came back, my voice had like improved like so much, so much louder, more uh-huh. like, you know, energy. And and then from there, just, yeah, certainly meeting the guys, uh, you know, Ren is an amazing musician, uh, the guy I'm in a band with, uh, and uh, playing with him has certainly like sort of brought me along technically a lot. Uh-huh. Harmonies is something I've kind of learned with those guys. And I suppose up to the point where I am right now, that pretty much encompasses my whole wow. kind of music, musical journey. Um, so cool. But I think that trip, yeah, certainly. That trip I did in 2015 was one of the most like uh-huh. um, influential things. Yeah. It sounds amazing. So busking has kind of been at the core of you as a musician. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, like certainly as like, as I've developed and taken more of a, lead role like sort uh-huh. of behind the microphone and stuff like that it's really because the thing about busking is it grows you so much it's so like i mean you bust yourself i mean i'm sure you know that like whenever someone throws a coin in your case it's not just money but it's like some i was saying to my friend the other day it's like emotional currency uh-huh. you know like it gives you like a little boost and gives you a sort of affirmation again like okay right cool i should I, sh- I am supposed to be here. Uh-huh. And that was the thing when I was when I was doing that trip abroad, and I've gone abroad traveling like loads of times mm-hmm. doing music and stuff like that. That was the thing was like sometimes go up random street in France somewhere like and you come out with your guitar and you're a bit like, can I play here? Like, am I going to get in trouble? Kind of is someone going to complain? Is it am I going to make any money? And then once the ball starts rolling, you suddenly realize like, yeah, and that grows you so much as a musician. And what I was saying to you before about how like, when it becomes your means, because I lived from busking for years, uh-huh. like making, that was like my sole income, just means you're out playing all the time and you hate it in the moment because you <laughs> you know, you're gonna do it like so much. But um, yeah, yeah, it becomes like a really good, um, like rounding, growing experience. It's so cool. I mean, you must have had a fair few experiences busking, having been to all these places. Can you like recall like a really memorable moment or, or a few maybe more all the times? <laughs> the top of my head. There's one that comes to mind straight away, which is people sometimes ask me the question like, what's the weirdest thing that ever happened to Brian or what's the strangest thing that ever happened busking? And there's probably so many I can think of, but like off the top of my head, there was one time in Brighton when I was playing with my, with the band, this blues band, um, uh, before I met René Romain and this guy come over to us um, to sort of, you know, have a chat and say, you know, you guys are really interesting. But he walked over with a pigeon in his hand. Oh, right. He had this pigeon in his hand. We're like, what's this guy doing? He's like walking over to us with a pigeon in his hand. And he says, you guys, you know, you're really cool. And we're like, you got the pigeon in your hand. He's like, yeah, so how did you guys meet? Where do you start? We're like, there's a pigeon in your hand. And he said, <laughs> said oh, this? Just chucked it and it flew off. What? Which was kind of strange. Um, obviously, I've had my share of run-ins, bad run-ins with uh-huh. people as well. Uh-huh. Um... Uh, people throw stuff at me. I've had, you know, um, been nearly arrested quite a few times. Really? Yeah, for just, just, there was a time in Italy when I was playing in Verona and these police came by and they said, you need a permit. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realise. And they said, it's fine. But as long as you stop, it's okay. I was like, okay. So I stopped, I packed up and I went somewhere else, just uh-huh. moved and started up somewhere and then the same two policemen walked oh. by again. <laughs> And they were, um, they wanted to find me and stuff. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, um, none of these, none of these feel quite like they justify I mean, the pigeon, some of the, the pigeon's strange. Pretty, yeah. It's definitely pretty strange. Pretty That's sort of Brighton all over, isn't it, really? You know, some strange guy like that. I don't know. Yeah. So how do you find, like, Brighton in comparison to a lot of these other places you've passed? What's, what's like, Brighton got for you? 
Um, I mean, like, just in terms of England, there's no, you know, most places you need a permit mm -hmm. and you might need to audition or pay some money or something for that, but Brighton's totally open in mm -hmm. that respect. You know, there's a couple places, as you know, you can't play, like in Churchill Square or something like that, but mostly it's just set up and, and, and the police are so tolerant here. Mm -hmm. You know, with the band, when we've been playing, we've been drawing huge crowds that like shut off the street and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And the police get called and they come and, well, they come eventually, you know, they're, they're really, but they're really good about it. They're really gracious about it. You know, they're really nice and they're really tolerant and, uh, you know, and you can sort of work out a kind of a, a boundary that's like, you know, we'll be respectful to you and you to us, so on, and no one's ever particularly aggressive or whatever, so. Yeah, it's a good place in that sense. Um, do you think that Brighton and Hove Council could do a bit more for buskers? Do you think there's anything they could do? No, they're so they're so great already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, like, they're so nice about it. They're so tolerant. I mean, if anything, we take the mick a little bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's not um, um, where we're having it. We're not busking anymore. We're having gigs in the street. Yeah, you know, yeah, and it's oh, kind wow. of um, so the fact that they even allow us to do that is like you know, like it's amazing, and it's it's great because I think they recognise that that's part of what Brighton is. You know, yeah, yeah. sometimes I've seen it. I remember a couple of summers ago there were these um, environmental officers and stuff going around, telling people there'd been a complaint and that they need to move. Mm -hmm. So it's during the height of summer when there was a lot of tourists around, and but they asked me. See, I was playing on Bond Street, and they asked me to pack up and stop. So I did, and I wandered up the road towards Gack, and then I saw them stop it like minutes later, talking to somebody else as well, and I was like as if there's been two complaints at either end of the, you know, not just, it wasn't even my end of the street, it was two, a couple of streets away. Uh -huh. So I was like, no, this is not like, they're going around there purposely telling people to stop. And I don't know why, maybe they're trying to clean up the image or something uh -huh. like that. But um, mostly they, they, they're very tolerant and, yeah. you know, it's a brilliant place to live uh -huh. in that respect, you know. For sure. Yeah, I love this place. Tell us a bit about um, how like the big push came to be. You've mentioned being Ren and things like this, but like, how did that? How did that come about? And and what was it like to? You know, you're pretty well known, um, especially on the channel, but like even just sort of throughout. How did how did that come about? Well, um, so I finished uni in 2016, and then I was busking sort of full time. Uh -huh. um, before that, I was actually like I was set to have like a. a proper job and okay. like was like stressing out like oh my god what am I going to do with my life rah, rah, rah. and then um at the last minute decided to pack it all in and hitchhike to a festival in Hungary with a friend a dear nice, friend of mine nice choice. Nice yeah nice yeah choice. and I had about three days we, we were in Croatia and I, I knew I had to move out of my house on Sunday in Brighton and we we're in Croatia just sort of taking it easy chilling on the beach <laughs> playing guitar and I was like what day is it and uh and she was like first day I was like I'm gonna be back in Brighton on Sunday. I've got to be moved out by Sunday morning. So we started hitchhiking like nonstop. Wow. I digress anyway. We got back, I made it back on the day we we're supposed to move out, the morning of or the night before or something. Um, and then after that, I, I ended up moving into a completely different living situation and I was busking full time to pay the rent. Um, and I used to see this guy on the street playing guitar and we'd always sort of like nod and say hello and I found out later that he knew me as the Bob Dylan guy because uh -huh. I was obsessed with Bob Dylan, uh -huh. the hat and the, and the harmonica and, and everything and um, we'd always sort of nod and say hello but we never really got talking and one day after a party I'd been up all night you know doing a bit too much of everything and I was really tired and I saw this guy playing guitar, this really nice amazing blues guitar, it was you know, with a loop pedal and I was sort of like, oh, that sounds really good and I just sort of sat down on this bench and kind of closed my eyes to listen to it and it stopped after a while. I was like, oh that's a shame. And when I sat up and looked to my left, he was right there sat next wow. to me, <laughs> sort of very elegantly dressed Frenchman and I said, oh hi, he was like, hi, how are you? And we got talking and we just hit it off. And we went to an open mic that night and played together and it was like nice. instant chemistry, it was absolutely amazing. So we started playing together steadily and then um, he was working as a waiter and bit by bit, he was coming out and playing more gigs with me and taking less hours at work until he was only working something like three hours a week or something like that. <laughs> and one day we were playing a street party and he had to go to work and he showed up about four, you know, a few hours late and he was like, oh, screw this, I'm just gonna pack this in. And then he started busking full time and we were playing together for about summer. And then um, obviously, uh, Romain and Ren had met through uh, 
Facebook page, I think. Oh, yeah. They'd found each other, you know, looking for like-minded musicians to live with. And I got to know Ren really through Romain. Uh-huh. And um, I think we were just hanging out a lot as friends. And we, one time we went out busking. I think it was, we went out like Pride 2017. Uh -huh. was the first time we ever played together. And like this huge crowd of people, just amazing response, you know, it was really fun. Um, totally unexpected. Uh, and then the next day we went out with a drum kit bass guitar and a guitar without any microphones because all our voices were busted and we were knackered and we started playing like that and um, we were playing like funk music Ren was playing drums he's not really a drummer it was all a bit sketchy you know and um, we did that a few times and in the coming weeks and we started seeing videos of us pissing around basically pop up on Facebook like does anyone know who the funk band is <laughs> you know, like, none of us even know how to play funk you know like it was terrible but it was it was fun and we were having a laugh and I think that resonated with people and then people we we, we used to play outside coalition a lot me and Romain um and people would ask us so often Ren started coming down we all started jamming and it was all a total mismatch of styles and things and people would ask us so often what the band was called we were like well let's let's form a band maybe we should get together yeah, the three of us nice. and do like some kind of trio thing and Glenn was playing with another a mutual friend of ours a guy called Rafa West um, and Rafa had Glenn wasn't a drummer he was a bass player okay. and Rafa had lent him a hi-hat a suitcase bass pedal and a, a snare drum <laughs> Um, and so I've given him this, like this the gear. Busker's drum kit. Yeah, exactly. And he used to carry it all around in the suitcase. Nice. And um, and then uh, we basically poached Glenn from Rafa. Sort of like, don't, don't go out of Rafa today, come with us kind of thing, you know. Um, and uh, and then um, we eventually we convinced him to quit his band playing bass <laughs> and join us full time. And then I guess it really took off in around 2019 when we started actually filming our mm -hmm. sessions. But for a while, we were just kind of more busking and taking mm -hmm. it a bit more easy. Um, but it got a bit more serious once the YouTube started to take uh -huh. off. That's where it Did started. you like at any point expect it to kind of spiral into what it is today? Um, and when did you notice that it was? Like, I think the thing is, is like, we are all from quite, me, Ren and Romain are from quite different sort of musical backgrounds. Yeah, yeah. And so when we formed the band, I feel like it was kind of like, we were all sort of finding a common ground together mm -hmm. and sort of working at, you know, like, how can we, how can we grow this the most? And what can we do to, you know, to make this kind of, you know, decent or whatever. And, um, yeah, they, um, sorry, uh, trying for, I, I guess... We sort of, yeah, we were trying to, I mean, in not in a million years, no, did I ever think it yeah, was going to go yeah, this far or get this big, you know, and I, none of us, I don't think actually any of us could have really expected, you know, to be playing to like a thousand people at uh -huh. chalk and stuff like that. And people, and as well, just for the growth and the reach. Mm -hmm. So in, in a short answer, no, but like, <laughs> but like it was, I suppose it was kind of the intention. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, we tried, we always tried to make the most of it and kind of meet somewhere in the middle in terms of our styles and things and kind of, you know, push it in that direction. Excuse the pun. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, not definitely not as big because it's gone so far. I remember with a website we had, you could see where your fans were uh -huh. around the world. I remember looking, I knew it was, you know, it grown uh -huh. a lot. But I remember looking at it and it, it being seeing it actually on a map, you know, Russia, wow. Africa, America, yeah. like South America, like it was, uh -huh. it was insane, yeah. And and so, yeah. And then the response and generally the way it's grown and everything has been so cool. Yeah, so it's cool. been amazing. It's Hard to comprehend, but so cool. Yeah, I'm still not really. <laughs> you know, I, I think when we did our first show, it was about two or three months later that I was watching some of the footage, looking at it, thinking. Oh, well, I'm, I'm actually a part of that. Like, because I was at the time, I was kind of like, I'm here playing, but everyone's here to see the other three. Uh -huh, They're already uh -huh. here to see, you know what I mean? So it's it always takes me a little while to catch up on uh, whatever it is. It's really on. cool, man. So you've mentioned Bob Dylan and mm. and a few other artists. Who would you say your kind of influences are? Who who's like your uh, you know? Your musical heroes, I guess. Yeah, I mean, like, the first band that ever really resonated was the Sex Pistols. Uh -huh. And that was because they were just so passionate, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and then David Bowie uh -huh. flipped over to glam rock, then started exploring a bit more stuff that I'd always kind of known through. My dad was quite into, like, Led Zeppelin and uh -huh. Pink Floyd and stuff like that. Um, but 
then I started discovering more of that for myself. And then, um, yeah, I started listening to Bob Dylan and that like changed the way I listened to music. I started actually really listening to lyrics a lot mm-hmm. more because I remember the first time a uh, Dylan song like really clicked with me and I was like, whoa, this is actually like, this is on another level, you know, like this guy's doing something completely different. And that's sort of the uh, dichotomy between poetry and music, you know, and that's what songwriting mm-hmm. is. It's bringing both of those things together. And more, I suppose in the last sort of, as I've gotten a bit older in the last couple of years, I've sort of become more cynical and, oh, you know, pessimistic and almost anyway. But <laughs> I started getting, I've, I've really started to resonate a lot with Neil Young a lot. Okay. So yeah, I suppose yeah. now, these days, a lot of my songwriting and generally as a singer and, mm-hmm. and writing and stuff is shaped a lot by Bob Dylan, mm-hmm. Neil Young, uh, Rodriguez is obviously amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I started, I've been getting really back into Pink Floyd a lot recently mm-hmm. as well, but more sort of specific, the Roger Waters side of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Wall is just such an amazing, painful, beautiful album, mm-hmm. you know, like that's really, that's really good. Um, and I've been listening to a bit of Nick Drake and getting more into folk rock recently, you know, Joni Mitchell and stuff like that. Yeah. But certainly, I guess my sort of taste is going to stem from older stuff. Uh-huh. There's some newer stuff I like, like I really like Jack White uh-huh. um, and a lot of the stuff he's done, especially the Raconteurs, mm-hmm. Brendan Benson. Um, so even the newer stuff I like, I guess, is kind of, but I do listen to everything. I even listen to a, a lot of electronic music as well. My brother was big into drum and bass. My <laughs> mum's big into trance music. I've gone myself to a few trance festivals. Oh, really? and stuff like. So I, I like electronic stuff as well. That's awesome. Yeah. So like, it's, it's cool that they, the core, I mean, maybe electronic fits into this, but like the core is like this, like you say, poetry and... And I think you can hear that in your music as well as the big push, like the kind of Thank like you. bringing that together. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Um, so we spoke about the big push, but you recently released an EP. Mm. So tell us about that journey, like your sort of solo. Yeah, right. Okay. And and what's mm. what's coming up? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, I've always written songs, and I think probably about ninety percent of the songs I write never get heard. Let alone because yeah. I've only released five or six ever. You know. <laughs> But like, I, you know, my friends are probably more familiar with some of the some of the unreleased stuff. And I did produce some stuff a little while ago, um, but never got around. I only released You Are The One. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and I've always, yeah, I've always, I've always written loads, but I never, haven't been that good at releasing it, I guess. And um, the guys living with Ren and Remain for the last two years and knowing them for the last four, they're so productive and they work so hard and they're constantly sort of like working to put stuff out or whatever. And I think in context of the band, I began to feel a little bit like I'm getting left behind in terms of my own sort of musical kind of identity or whatever. Like I need to show people that I actually do something as well. And I guess I was quite into the, I stopped doing my solo stuff around the time we started the band. I was pretty much ready to quit, honestly, because I struggle a lot with, you know, the music industry Mm -hmm. side and career side of things. And I have conflicts about Mm -hmm. art and, you know, music and stuff like that. Um, Fine edge on this. Yeah, it's weird once you start to monetize things and turn stuff into a career, you know? So, um... Uh, yeah, I feel at odds with it a lot. And I, I, I was feeling very much like that. I thought I was ready to quit. And I was like, well, I'll, I'll try this band thing out and see how it goes. And you know, I'm still here doing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. awesome. Um, and then, it got, so it's got to the point in the last couple of years where I started looking around thinking, I need to release something. So I had, you know, obviously lots of, loads of songs, you know, that I've written over the years and some that would suit more than a band arrangement. But I had some that worked quite well, I felt, just me, myself, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe a bit of harmonica or whatever in that sort of Dylan-esque style where I left off. Um, And um, so I decided to just go into a room and track those. And I did it just in a completely different way. I did it completely live, didn't use a click, didn't even have headphones. I just sat in front of the mic and played. Because I think for me, that's the way I like to play best, you know, it's like just kind of Mm -hmm. in the the very live sort Mm -hmm. of thing. And so these song, these are songs spanning from, I think I wrote Nothing Special in 2017. I did uh, If, I wrote that in 2016. One More For The Weekend, 19. So they're kind of like all spread around over the last four or five years. And um, I really just wanted to have something out. But rather than just put some songs out, I thought, well, I may as well promote this a little bit and try and make some nice artwork or whatever. <laughs> and, um, and that's the EP. But I think next... I've got obviously a bunch of songs that um, 
one I know Jao really likes, which is uh, uh, Que Sera. Um And, you know, I think these would benefit a bit more with a band, you mm. know? The only trouble is the only band, the only people I want to be in a band with, I'm already in a band with. <laughs> band, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. So I'm sort of in a bit of a weird place where, like, I don't know how to go about it or how to sort of where to start cool. in terms of, like, I don't know whether to go in and track it all myself uh-huh. bit by bit, find, like, a session player or two or to get another band together maybe. But I definitely have, I want to kind of record something, you know, that is more more band mm-hmm. arrangement and I already have songs to do that as well That's awesome so, so we, can, we can expect it we'll absolutely absolutely and I'm generally speaking I've got a lot of stuff coming out anyway just from these last few uh-huh. songs or whatever um, I recorded the my first headline show at Folklore um, so I'm going to have some videos from that coming out awesome and I've got a couple other bits I did a while ago that I haven't released either so it's really cool really, it's really just, cool just planning it yeah, doing yeah, it you know what I mean it's so on. bad at that like the juggling act of doing solo stuff and being a band like it's hard enough just doing one so all credit to you yeah i find it hard with the motivation (laughs) okay do you have say for a musician or a busker or somebody who's just starting like to do to begin their journey into being a musician what would your advice be and both in terms of like playing music but also going into busking yeah, well, I think busking is like a great way for anyone to play music because it, it, you know, just just do it as much as you possibly can, basically. I mean, busking is great. It's a great place to learn because there's, there's not really as much, ex- there's almost less expectation in a weird kind of way. It can seem really daunting to just stand out there in front of everyone and say like, and you're basically kind of saying, hey, look, here I am, or listen to me or whatever, you know. But like, at the same time, a lot of people, you know, if you're feeling nervous, a lot of people don't care. <laughs> you know, like people, it's so great because people can either like just carry on walking or if they, if they don't like it, it doesn't matter, they can just leave. Or if they like it, they'll stop and listen. They'll have a chat with you or give you some money or, or whatever it is. And that sort of builds your, grows your confidence, you know. And whereas at a gig, you might be kind of like a support act and someone's there waiting to see the main thing, and a lot of people might not even bother to, Mm -hmm. people might just be sort of waiting around for you to, you know, waiting around for you to finish so they can see the next thing. But like with busking, I find like it's so much more like freeing, you know? Um, So yeah, definitely just doing it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. It's it's just, it'll just gonna help. Uh It's like the foundation, it will build you as a musician but with no pressure. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's really yeah. cool. You can play like as long as you want. You can take a break for 15 minutes uh-huh. if you want. There's no, there's, there's sort of no expectation of it. Uh-huh. And you might get a few donations yeah. if you're doing it right or if you're not, I don't know. Um, what is your favorite song to busk? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it varies um, from kind of, you know, from whatever it is I'm listening to or whatever it is I've learned. Um, I think I have some in my repertoire that like I kind of know will, I know like they either kind of show off like some aspect of my playing that will draw people in, uh-huh. or, you know, my voice or something like that that will generally get me more drops or, so I save some for moments like that. At the moment, I'm really enjoying playing Harvest Moon by Neil oh, Young. Cool. Um, but, you know, I started busking a lot more of my own originals as well since I started doing the gig and sort of throwing those in there and stuff. Um, but yeah, it really varies. Really varies, on uh-huh. whatever. Nice. I wouldn't well. say there's. I wouldn't say there's like any. I don't tend to like play any, um, any well-known songs. Really, mm-hmm. <laughs> I kind of just play whatever I feel. Because uh-huh. if I if I don't if I'm not feeling it, then I find like it doesn't. That kind of comes across. Uh-huh. So I spend a lot of, when I'm playing by myself. I do tend to play a lot of like. I'll play something by like Towns Van Zandt or um, Robert Johnson or something. Mm-hmm. I people. There are people out there in the world who are massive fans uh-huh. of these sort of songwriters and will know, you know, will know it or whatever. And so that's kind of cool when someone does come along and say, hey, I really like that song. And I'm like, oh, great, you know it. <laughs> you know, or like I'll play some B-side of David Bowie's from the 60s or something like that. And like, you know, but for me, it just, that's where I feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. That's what I feel comfortable doing. So I can't, when people come up to me and say, do you take requests? And I say, is it by Bob Dylan? <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> like, I mean, maybe. But like I doubt it, you know, kind of thing, and I just feel a lot better just playing whatever mm-hmm. it is I find comfortable. It's almost like the energy of you being comfortable with that song, or you even enjoying that song, would come across. Yeah, and that's my issue, I suppose, is that my tastes are just a little <laughs> bit obscure. You know, there's not they're not 
passenger and they're not you know he's great whatever mm -hmm. but like I, I wouldn't go near it uh -huh. you know me and Romain tried playing Wonderwall once <laughs> didn't know the chords <laughs> didn't know the words <laughs> You know, well, we still kind of played it because it's quite a straightforward song, and uh, you know, I, it's a brilliant song. I like Oasis, you know, but we tried playing it and just it just didn't. We didn't we didn't get a single penny. I don't <laughs> think you know, it just didn't work for mm -hmm. us. But that's because well, our heart wasn't in it. And I guess we're those we're just that kind of musician, you know, like. But um, yeah, I think it's it's inspiring to know that like you know, you're not going out of your way to play songs just because they'll be received well. You're thinking more like, what do I know? What do what I know? Can like? I do the best? And yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna learning that more and more, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, sometimes if I'm feeling, especially if something's been filmed or recorded or something like that, and I'm starting to get inside my own head about it and worrying about, or I'm becoming disassociated from what I'm doing, I just think about the next lyric I'm about to sing and like, I conjure up some memory or image or something like that, that 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 resonates with me for that lyric and I just focus and I say come on like I sort of try to bring myself back into myself and say like no come on let's like focus here what what does this mean to you and try and jump into that emotion whilst you're playing and like I think that's a great thing to fall back on you know so we've been asking all the buskers this question and you can go as deep or you can be as literal as you want what is music to you <laughs> um, I mean, it's, I mean, for me personally, it's, it's something, it's obviously kind of my life, I've made my life so sort of centers around it. Um, I think what it is to me, it is to so many other people as well. It's kind of, it's such an accessible thing, mm -hmm. like in the way that it's like a smell in the terms of the way it can bring back memories and stuff like that, transport you to a place so instantly. And I still have songs that do that, you know, um, take you back to a certain time and place. And I think that's how it is for a lot of people. And I think that's the most amazing thing about music is how much it does sort of touch anyone and everyone. Not everyone can sort of, Look, I don't want to, I mean, not everyone can look at a Van Gogh and say, oh, that's great, although they should, because it is. But like, you know, or whatever, maybe that's, maybe that's not a good example, because it is awesome. But like, <laughs> painting is a bit harder, or it's, you know, it could be sort of like a bit more highbrow. Not everyone enjoys reading or whatever, you know. But music, everyone can instantly kind of like, get, get, you know, sort of tugs at your heart or whatever. And so, so I think that aspect of it is absolutely you know, very significant and absolutely amazing. And for me, it's, it's, there's the, there's the, you know, as a person who plays music and creates music as well, there's going to be that sort of side to it and that like, it's, it's extremely cathartic. And I think, I suppose on a slightly different note, like songwriting for me is kind of, um, you know, it's such an amazing thing. I guess that's just creativity in general and just creating in general. It's such an amazing thing that once you, once I finish a song that I've written, even if it's just literally just between me, the guitar and the book that I've written it down in, the moment it's finished and I've recorded it on my phone, it's done. It's such a lift and such an overall, do you, do you ever feel, do you write yeah. yourself? Yeah. 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 So I you know, know that, exactly you know, that feeling about. like, yeah. It's like really like, even if that's the only thing I did all day, you know, that's like amazing, mm -hmm. you know? So I guess there's that side of myself that it sort of satisfies as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like it's a, it's a it's a sort of a reason to live and it's um also a way for so many people to feel something uh -huh. right it's so well said it's a reason <laughs> to live and it's like this universal connection language or something yeah, yeah completely and really well said and completely resonate with the you know creativity as a feeling for you you know making something is it's a, you just didn't realise how feeling. important it is <laughs> until you kind of do it sometimes, you know. Right. It's really well said. Um, Goran, let everyone know where they can find you on social medias and things. Right, yeah. Uh, so it's Goran Kendall, which is G-O-R-R-A-N, Kendall, K-E-N-D-A-L-L. Um, that's it pretty much across the board. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Um, I say I'm Spotify as well, obviously. Um, yes, just plug in there. And if you like it, that's great. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the basket break. Thanks, man. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching the busking break here on the Brighton Beach Busking YouTube channel. If you haven't already, then please click subscribe, 
like this video and hit the notifications bell so you know when videos have been posted. Go and check out our busking guest. All their links are in the description. I have been your host, August Radio Project. If you're a musician, creative, and you like challenges, or you need some tips and tricks, then go and check out my YouTube channel, also linked in the description. Thank you to Works for welcoming us to the Works Pier and believing in the project. If you're a creative looking for workspace in Brighton, contact Works through the details in the description. They offer co-working, craft space, sound studios, offices, meeting rooms, and more. Also, thank you to Mug Time for the wonderful mugs. You can find the link to their Amazon shop in the description below. And thank you to you for watching the busking break. And I'm sure I will see you in the next one. Thank you.